the, to the lectures that we have seen this morning, um, because we will consider a system of two FKTP equations that are coupled. Um, but as I'm not in, not in analysis, but in probability, we will then use probabilistic tools to understand something about these equations. And as a motivation, you can view these coupled equations as a population consisting of, of A particles and B particles. Um, but to be honest, that's not really necessary in this talk. We will focus on how to understand the equations behind it. But um, for, okay, but let me, let me start. So we have A particles and we have B particles. And we look at the following system. So we have an evolution of the number of A individuals given by a half dxx and A plus alpha and A. Then there's a carrying capacity which plays the role of the total population K minus n a minus n b so this is just k minus the total population and then we have minus beta n a plus gamma n a and b and okay something fell down um, and then we have the same, I will say a bit more on the interpretation in a second, we have a second equation, which is for the B, B population that also diffuses in space with the Laplacian. And then there's also a growth term and B times K minus N A minus N B. Okay. Um, we have plus beta and a minus gamma and a and b. Okay. So, how do we think about this? So, we have a population, and then there's a subpopulation that has a good trait a, and this good, and the populations of n a and n b, they both grow at a certain rate alpha. Um, times somehow the free space I still have. And then I can lose this trait A as a constant rate beta and I become, and I become the non, the particle that has, does not have this trait. And then at a certain weight, um, you know, an A particle and a B particle can become two A particles. And the fact that we both have a diffusion term here is just means that they both advance at the same speed. Okay, um, so this is when this this in some sense is closer to the FKPP equation coming from a bio, as a as a biological model which hasn't really appeared so far and will actually also not be our concern. So so this this whole thing these equations are somehow motivated by um, appeared in a paper by. Venegas, Ortiz, et al. And it appeared in genetics. Um, about uh, maybe 10 years ago. And so wh what is somehow Okay, why does it look like an FKPP equation? Well, we have the diffusion, you know, Laplace with the one half because I do probability theory. And then we have a term which is essentially alpha and A. So this is a linear thing. Um, uh, so this is a linear thing. And then here there's the term where the total population comes in. So this gives you somehow nonlinearity. So, so what we are going to, to, to do now is, well, instead of considering NA and NB together, we, what we can do is we can add the two things together because then all this interaction stuff disappears, right? So if we take NT 
to be the sum of Na and Nb, then the equation for Nt is really just a half the Laplacian and then alpha Nt K minus Nt. Right, so then we really have, so this is nothing but the FKPP equation. Okay. So instead of studying these two equations, we can study the, the equation for NA and the equation for NT and then get the other equation back. So we have one thing that's just the FKPP equation, you know, with some alpha and some K stuff in front and one equation where we see an interaction, right? Because um, the way we would like to view the second equation for NA, that should work. So the second equation, for, uh, so the NA equation, where right, we could also just phrase it slightly differently um, and just say, okay, this is Laplacian alpha NA, then it's K minus the total population eta Na and then gamma Na total population minus Na. And so instead of studying these two original equations, what we can do is study these two equations. And the nice thing is that due to this choice, right? So we have this coupled system of equations before, but now actually the first equation became independent. Right? So the total population is just a standard FKPP equation. And the second one also looks like an FKPP type of equation. Um, but it, it depends on the first equation, right? So somehow the second equation sees what, so, so the, the trait A sees what the total population in some sense is doing and it's actually interfering. So, so now what we, so now you see all these parameters and actually we don't really want to worry too much about all these parameters. So we're just going to, to rescale things. So we are going to define us a beta tilde, which is beta over alpha times K and a gamma tilde, which is gamma divided by alpha. And then we take, take rescalings of these equations. Okay, let me not really make it precise um, what these are. And then we're just going to look at, and so with this rescaling, we're going to do it as follows. We do it such that the equation for this and T becomes the usual FKPP equation. And the other one is whatever it then gets in a sense. So we get DTV is the half V plus V one minus V. And the other equation we study is DTW being a half um, so we have this and then uh, a half Laplacian XXW and then we have W times now it's one, not one minus V but it's one minus beta tilde minus one minus gamma tilde V minus gamma tilde W So we have a linear term in W in the second equation. We have a square term W in the second equation. And then we have an interaction term with the V. Okay. And now we want to understand this. And we're going to be interested in the case where one is larger than gamma tilde, beta tilde, greater than zero. Okay. So we somehow want that 
the, inter the, the growth by interaction is larger than the growth of its own. And from now on, you can forget the other equations. We're just going to be interested in this. And what what we want to want what we want to understand now is what is the traveling wave speed of this? What what is the you know what happens with the second equation? So so what is the role of this interaction? So how can we start thinking about this? Well, we think about this V to be the, comp to, so we, we think about this picture somehow, we have this whole population somewhere here, and then we have this subpopulation that, you know, somehow below and might be lacking behind. So the first thing we might think about is what happens if the total population has already, I mean, if this one, if, if somehow, the first FKPP equation is not really a traveling wave kind of profile as Lenya said this morning, but it's already just one. One is a nice fixed point. And if this is just equal to one, then in the second equation, right, I can just plug in one here. And then I get, then I get a normal FKPP equation for the second one. And I would just say, well, if v of zero and x, let's say it's just the indicator function s is less or equal than zero, then I would see that the, pop, the, the, the subpopulation is going to advance and have a traveling wave of speed square root two gamma tilde minus beta two. Because as we have learned this morning, if I take heavy side, if I take this initial condition, then I'm going to take the, the slowest traveling wave I can find. And in this case, it's just that. So the question now is, if V is not already everywhere one, right? So if, if the total population, if, if the population is still discovering space, Right, and I'm not starting from one, but I'm more starting from a curve like this. Right, what is the speed of the subpopulation? Or what is the shape of W? Is it, is it going to be faster than what I see in the case where the NT is already one everywhere or is it slower or is it the same? Okay, so, so we want to understand this effect. And well, what we're going to, to do is we are going to make our life so you say if the V is not already one, what's a good candidate, right? The, a good candidate would be that V is also just the indicator, it's also just some indicator function, right? So the population is somehow has seen negative space and it's moving into positive space or something like that. Something that's closer to this picture over there. Um, so, so now we don't really want to mess too much. I mean, the, this V equation we understand very well, right? And we don't really want to mess too much with it so what we are just going to do is we will just say that the initial condition here is just the traveling wave at position x so this is uh traveling wave with a critical speed and in my normalization it's going to be square root of two Because then we already know that if I move forward in time, this wave profile is just going to move forward and we don't have to worry about it adjusting by time to the shape of the traveling wave. So this is just going to be x minus square root of t, right? 
So, so we have solved completely the first equation and we just want to understand what happens uh, to the second equation. Okay. And what we will see, I will just put it in words here, is that is that you actually move so the speed of w right the linear let's say linear right will be something like will be square root of will increase so it can be square root of 2 minus beta tilde two over two gamma tilde times one plus square root of one minus gamma tilde. If this is larger than the thing that we see when it's already one everywhere. So if so if I start the one, one equation with essentially heavy side initial condition, the second one can actually move forward faster than when I would have started from the already from, from everything one. Okay. So, yes. So, so I'm not sure I'm following this. Yes. If you look at this equation, it seems yes. that uh, for W. The saturation density is, is higher in the region where v is zero than when v is one. Yes. So, so what does the, the what does the, the, the traveling wave of W look like jointly with that of v? Ah, means. so I'm going to talk about this. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. I mean, essentially, I'm going to talk about this. So, <laughs> yes. So, so, so where does where does this speed up effect come from? It comes from the fact that, well. This W, as Junyong said, it can, I should probably uh, switch here. Um, so here, right, if the V is one everywhere, I cannot go to regions where it's zero. But if there are regions where the V is zero, this is going to help me build up the W, okay? Because then this term becomes larger. And so the question is, you know, can I actually go to the, I mean, how do I, do I see the regions where the V is zero if I let them evolve together? And the answer is yes. And what I will try to explain now is actually why this is the case. If I had to guess, I would guess that it'd be like, you know, root two times one minus beta tilde, right? I mean, this is kind of, okay. So if you put this to zero, yes. But of course, you will pay a price for this. I mean, it will become clear in a second. So somehow, I cannot be all. I cannot be all that. I cannot use some. I have to pay. So if I use regions where v is zero, I have to pay for this. It's somehow not for. Okay, okay. I will explain how I think about this equation, and then it will also become clear about what I mean by going to regions. Okay, because the way we I want to think about this is 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 via the Feynman Katz representation. So the first equation we don't need to solve, but the second one, for the second one, we can use the Feynman Katz representation. And by that, we get that WTX is the expectation of we have a Brownian motion starting in X exponential. Now we integrate from zero to T, one minus beta tilde, one minus gamma tilde. Um, now we have the traveling wave of the first equation. We just plug it in. V s square root two T minus S. And this is all in the exponential minus gamma tilde W T minus S. Is this W or V of V S? 
Um, so the one minus gamma tilde has the V, but the V is already set to omega. And then we have minus S, V, S. Yes. Inside, this is all in the exponential. And then we also have the initial condition of the W, not in the exponential. Okay. So this is really just writing down the usual fermi cutts formula for an FKPP <coughs> equation where the nonlinearity now contains this other function. And now, right, what I can do is I can write this Brownian motion as a Brownian bridge and its endpoint, and I can integrate it. So now the next formula will get a bit lengthy, but then we're going to shrink it immediately. So we get an expectation now over the Brownian bridge, e to the minor e to the integral zero t, then it's one minus beta tilde minus one minus gamma tilde. And now in here, we get x t minus s over t, s over t times y. Now we have a Brownian bridge from zero to zero in time t at position s. Okay, so this is really just, and then I have to subtract square root two <coughs> t minus s inside. So there's nothing mysterious. It's really just replacing the, uh, so the integral over the endpoint and the Brownian bridge into two bits and minus gamma tilde w t minus s and now it's x t minus s over t s over t y um, okay um, and then plus the Brownian bridge from zero to zero in time t at position s ds. And now, of course, there's the y I haven't really said anything about. Well, the y should be the integral over the endpoint. Let me just put it in front because we're going to. And then we have dy e to the minus the Gaussian density. What? The w of zero bt. Yeah, you need a W of zero and Y. Ah, yes, yes, you're right. That's true. Um, let me put it here. Thanks. So now this is long formula. But now, okay. Now <clears throat> we put here, let's say for this V W zero for, for this W zero Y, let's just say this is the indicator so we said okay we look at cases where it's advancing so let's just take it to be the indicator function y is less than zero okay. so this means that y is negative and so it's not going to help us to gain in the omega okay so right and okay, so we want to make this easier. So we think of this of an indicator function. And also we are going to say that omega, okay, for the purpose of the rest of this talk is an indicator, is roughly an indicator function of this thing that's inside being smaller than the one. Okay. Right? Because I mean, there's some order one stuff, but we don't care. So the traveling wave goes from zero to one, it uh, goes from one to zero in a region of order one. So it's almost as good as an indicator function. So we're going to pretend it's an indicator function. And we are going to pretend that the Y is always negative. So I let you stare for a second at this formula and I clean the board. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, so I'm trying to interpret your equation. So if theta is zero, uh, I know that your star is not the same, but yes. if theta is zero, yes. it's like you have two uh, mutations that are neutral. Yes. Right? You have two mutations that don't have an adaptation of each other. Yes. Right? Over space. And now this is theta, that's so you increase the start at that rate. Uh, the speech is yes. So, it, it, that's the way you interpret it? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, th I think in this, I mean, in this paper that kind of I mentioned, it's more that you have a trait and then you can lose it again. I mean, you have an advantage and then you can lose this advantage again. But, but the funny thing is that this beta is also birth rate of the B species. Um, right. So I was trying to interpret yeah. interpret your equation here. Yes. If there's no beta, then I understand you have two mutations that are sort of a neutral label. They have yes. no, no advantage of each other, yes. but they both have advantage alpha or, or is it alpha? They, they, they both have the same advantage over space, right? They, they invite, invade space. Yes. That's how this FKPP arise when you add them up. But now, if yes. you introduce, right, introduce the beta, that's a death rate for species A, but it's a birth rate for species yes. B. Yeah, I mean, it really, you should really think about it. If you so, you so it's not the individual dying, but it's the individual losing the trait and then just being in the other subpopulation. Okay. So, so if you're not in A, but so, you were in A, and oh, this beta okay. just makes you go to B. So it's a mutation. It's a switching rate. Mutation rate, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we think so so okay so if this is an indicator right so here this is an indicator so we want this so to go to regions where this is zero we want we want this thing here right so so if there would be an advantage over what we have of this being just one we we need the only thing we could use is is, is what's written in these orange parentheses goes to um, it's written in the orange parentheses, somehow goes to regions where it's zero by using the Brownian bridge. Okay, so if the y is always negative, it cannot help me. Right, because if y is negative, the best thing I could do is pick it to zero so that I'm not disturbed. So what we do is, <clears throat> To, to understand, so, uh, and, and this can be made precise. So we just say, okay, somehow the best thing we can do is, um, is that the y in the y integral is equal to zero so that we don't have this outer indicator function anymore, right? So then, and we have this, what this all simplifies to, and now we're going to regions where it's actually going to start to look nice again. We have one over square root two pi t, um, then e to the minus x square over two t from the first integral that's still there. Then we have the expectation over e, and now we're going to e this, and now we're going to rewrite this. So we have, so this is an indicator function, right? So what we are going to, to define is a random variable, which is the integral from zero to T that counts how often, how long our Brownian bridge is such that this object, we have this, okay, let me, okay, let me just do it in two steps, maybe that's easier. Um, so we have one minus beta tilde minus one minus gamma tilde <coughs> the omega, but now the omega is nothing but the indicator function xt minus, is roughly the indicator function xt minus s over t plus the Brownian bridge from zero to zero in time t of s, 
minus square root two t minus s. And now we have the second part, which is minus gamma tilde this w. But now what are we going to do with this w? Well, this is the whole population, right? So in regions where we could bother to go to here, go to zero. Um, and here, this is already. So is there an integral of x here or? Uh, yes, sorry. This has not disappeared. So I have not done much. I have just said, okay, the traveling wave of the first equation is the indicator function. And for all regions where we care about for the Bonian bridge to go, our equation that we're actually looking at is already going to be at zero so that we can ignore it, right? I mean, the picture you should really have in mind is the following. So we have this omega, so we have this traveling wave which moves forward of this shape omega of X, which is essentially the indicator function. And then we have a, something that's lagging behind, okay? And now here, this increment just says, we collect something. So we collect a one here if, if the Bernian bridge is such that we are located in this bit and we collect a zero if we are located somewhere in this bit. If we are always in the part where it's one, we cannot really gain anything because that's the boring situation. But what's interesting is somehow whether we can make use with our Brownian bridge and use parts where it's zero, right? But if, if we go to parts where this is, where, where the white line is zero, the orange line is already going to be zero, essentially zero, right? So we are not going to care about this. Okay. But now, right? Now actually things become better because now, now I, the only thing I need to understand is somehow that now what's here? Well, this is constant. I mean, this is a constant. And now in this indicator function, it's just an indicator function, right? So if I draw this picture, I have a line that has slope square root two t minus s. It has to, right, it's somehow winding backwards in time. It goes from zero to zero. And I have this curve. And then I have this time where the Bernian bridge might be might be larger than this line. Okay. And during this time, you collect you have a zero, right? The omega of whatever is essentially zero. So this indicator function is zero, and here it's one. Right? So the only thing that you need to understand now is what is what is the price of, of doing this? Right. So, so if you want to go to regions, regions where the omega is zero, you need to have your Brownian bridge to go to go above this line that has slope square root two for a certain duration of time. Right. So if it stays for some time t above this curve, then I collect zero during this time. And for the rest of the time, I get the, I collect one. But of course, if this is a brand new bridge and I want to do this for, and this should be like a large portion of time, this is very expensive. And so this is expensive. Go to the other blackboard. And, and what does being expensive means? Well, it means, so we think of this excursion above this line to be of a linear order in T because everything we care about currently is of linear order in T. So if you want to be above, if you have a brand new bridge and you want to be it to be above a line of, of, you know, of a certain slope for a time that's of order T, that's actually going to be expensive, really expensive. It's exponentially unlikely to do this. Right. 
But of course, on the other hand, so it's exponentially unlikely, but of course, on the other hand, you gain in the exponential. So both of the effects are really of the same of, of the same form. And to make to put this into a nicer form, we can rewrite what we just learned once again at square root two t e to the minus x square over two t. And then we just pulled out a few things. So gamma tilde minus beta tilde t. And then it's the expected value of e to the one minus gamma tilde times t t. And this t t is exactly the time where the Brownian bridge is above above this line, right? And I just did something stupid here because I put it a square root two T minus S here. Actually, there's also, um, there should also be an X over T for the slope times T minus S, right? Because in the omega, there's also the X component and the, the X we think of as being linearly large. So this should be larger than square root two minus X over T, T minus S. So everything we have to do is actually to compute the Laplace transform, right? But of course this Laplace transform, well, we can essentially just look at the probability of the best way of getting this event. So, essentially the probability that, that that i spent right so essentially the probability that i spent a really large time above this line it's dominated essentially by the probability that this brownian bridge from one direction or the other direction let's say yes is at this right moment in time at the position of the line. Because the S, we think of this as being of linear order. So really realizing this event means the Brownian bridge goes there. And so the price for this on an exponential scale is just e to the minus square root two minus x over t squared s times t over 2t minus s by the Brownian density. Right? So to get the optimal one, to get the optimal s that we want to have, what you have to do is, well, you have to maximize the exponent I've just written down, square root two minus X over T squared, S T divided by two T minus S. And together with what you get in the Laplace transform. Okay. And this is actually going to be, this is going to tell you what is the optimal event for the Brownian bridge in our equation, right? And this is going to tell us exactly for how long we are going to, in, uh, going to spend above here, and then we can just plug it in. Okay? And so this is going to give us an S star, if we simply compute the optimum. And if, this plug, if we plug this in, right, this is exactly going to give us the speed in the theorem that I mentioned at the very beginning, right? So I will leave it at this. So what I find particularly nice is if you use the Feynman Katz formula, you can really understand how this going to regions have where that are not yet populated where or where your solution of the other equation is zero actually happens, right? And you can draw it in a picture. Um, and I find it I find it very nice. Of course, I should say there also works from the analysis side on coupled FKPP equations. Um, 
And, and I mean, of course, we were kind of a little bit motivated by that of it as well, but we couldn't, there were some things we couldn't really understand why they are happening, they are happening. And so we just sat down and worked on the Famer Cuts formula. And I find it quite beautiful that uh, you actually see where everything comes from explicitly. Okay, I will stop here. Okay, there may be time for one quick question. Yes. So the, the Fisher cap PP gives the, the probability distribution of the rightmost particle yes. of a Brownian, not, not a Brownian motion. Now, now, here you have two kinds of particles. Yes. Is there an interpretation that particles have two colors and then? Uh, well, yes and no. So actually, the, this exact form of the equation, no. Um, there is uh, actually so if you reverse so so if you reverse so so this is interaction component um, of one particle that's a it comes b and so on it's this interaction component right so if you switch if you put the same sign of this interaction component in both equations then you get a systems of equation that uh, corresponds to the uh, to an on off branching Brownian motion in in the same way of correspondence as you have between BBM and the FKPP equation. There's some, some work by Jochen Blatt and also some older paper by Simon Harris, I think, that says, well, if, if somehow you put in the nonlinearity part something that's like a second Markov process generator, then you have an interpretation as a, as a two, partic uh, two particle diffusion process, whatever it is. Okay, so let's thank Lisa again.